looking out there, and there's some folks I didn't have the privilege of meeting and greeting and saying hello, and good to see our college folks back, okay? And some other college folks back, and uh, we've got a visitor here. Um, don't tell me, Don Allen, is that right? Okay, thank you so much for being here this morning. Are you, do you go to Freed Hardeman? I knew there was a special halo about you there. We appreciate that. Um, anyway, uh, grateful we are, and we're going to uh, get started. So we're talking about the, the book of James, and, and as you notice, this is our concluding lesson on the book of James. So if you are just here, you're, you know, this is your first time, I do uh, say uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to put it all together here. But if you want to uh, study some of the formal lessons, you can. You can go online and look at the lessons that are available online. And that's a good thing. The book of James. This is a, a picture of a model made of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, history tells us that James, as we know in Acts chapter 15, he was uh, a leader or a, he was a leader in the church at Jerusalem. And uh, he was part of that council that they had. You may remember that. What's interesting about this, this is portrays the temple and the area where uh, people would meet. But there's a, a very interesting thing about, um, about James. Now, I'm going to lower this down, and someone please low, put it back up when we're done. Uh, this is uh, uh, um, from, from some history. Actually, it's uh, Hegesippus. In his commentary, he did a commentary on the apostles, or he did some writing on that. But <clears throat> um, he stated that uh, James the Just, that's how he uh, became to be known, he went alone into the temple and prayed in behalf of the people, insomuch that his knees were reputed to have acquired the hardness of camels' knees. James, according to this passage, according to this record, prayed so heavily and so much and so often for God's people that his needs, you know, were affected. Um, would that we all would have that attitude. Now, we don't, we don't have video of him doing it, but we have that record. We also have another record of James, and that is his participation in this book brought to us, which is probably one of the most powerful books that we have in practical daily living as a Christian, the Proverbs of the New Testament, the book of James. When we think of the book of James, we know that we have to put, just like our life and our thoughts, there's a, there's a, there's a chronology to it. And so um, and when we look at Bible history from the beginning all the way through here to the New Testament, this is the section we're talking about. And if I could kind of blow that up. We know that um, Jesus, the master teacher, went about in James. Um, this James, we are believing, is the Lord's brother. And um, we, we get the general idea that the either 45 to 65 A.D. is when this letter was written. And, of course, in 70 A.D., Jerusalem was destroyed. So James, the Lord's brother, is giving us this book. And we have had the privilege of studying through it, beginning with Brother Chad and, and his getting the class off to a good start. And I was asked to take over for him so he could teach more about apologetics and the authenticity of the Bible to the teenage, teenagers. Um, and then Brother, uh, um, Brother Robert taught a class while I was gone. And so we're finishing it up today. So before we get started, any questions or comments? Okay, so I have a question for you. Have you ever wandered from the church? Yes, I have. Okay. Can figurative language teach concrete truth? Do we understand the Bible literally? That, my friends, is a loaded question. Do we believe God meant what he said in the Bible? Yes, we do. Does the Bible use literal language all the time? 
Behold, the lilies of the field, they grow not, neither do they toil. The master teacher, Jesus himself, used figurative language and all kinds of other language. But when Jesus taught the parables, he didn't say it means anything you want it to say. He used figurative language. We use it all at a time. Is Christianity the one true religion of the one true God? Now, if you're visiting and you're from maybe another uh, religious group or perhaps you're, you're not a... Um, don't pledge allegiance to Christianity, that statement may really be unnerving to you. It could possibly be that way. But is Christianity the one true religion of the one true God? <laughs> That's a powerful question. Yes, sir. So in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am what? The way, the way what? The truth. the truth and what? The life. Did he say a way? Huh? Did he say a truth? And Jesus in his prayer said, sanctify them in the truth, what? The word. Now just hold on a minute. We are told in our society we don't know everything. We must be skeptical about everything and that no one can know anything with certainty. When I had the privilege of standing before the science committee as a member of that committee in the state of Georgia when they were up doing, upgrading the science standards, I, um, I took issue with evolution being a part of the standards. And I read a letter out loud to them that totally rebuked it and said, we should be ashamed we're even including evolution in this. And most of the audience is going like this, okay? And I felt like I got smaller and smaller and smaller the more I read my letter. But one of the responses that was made from the audience is, you're talking like you're really sure about it. We don't know anything for sure. Nobody knows anything for sure. It's all just, you know, what, our best ideas. And I didn't want to, I, I would probably say this now, how sure are you that you're not sure? And they would say, buddy, we are really sure that we're not sure. Matter of fact, we're absolutely sure of it. Does anybody see a problem in that kind of thinking? Oh. <clears throat> what responsibility do we have to the unfaithful? Those that one, once obeyed God and now have become disobedient to their calling. What's it say, brother? Okay, so the dog, right, if you, the dog returned to his what? And the pig returned to his, okay, that is a sad condition for the believer that once was clean and then turns, turns away. What responsibilities do the unfaithful hold to themselves? In other words, we all made a commitment to God to become a Christian. Once we made that commitment, it's kind of like a marriage, isn't it? Okay, right? We made that commitment. No one made it for us. And we, we didn't commit ourselves to the idea of God. We committed ourselves to the one true God. And so if we are becoming unfaithful like an unfaithful spouse, we have done it by ourselves. And do we have responsibility for our actions? Can we blame somebody else? You know, you've heard the saying, whenever you point to somebody else, you have some other fingers pointing back to yourself. When will the outreach to the lost and erring be completed? Class. Okay, so when the Lord comes back, when the world ends, and that's an ongoing mission of the church, be in the light to the world. What an honor, though, it is for each and every member to have that as a part of their responsibility. 
Is this something that we should be working on all of the time? What are you and I doing about these, that is the unfaithful and the lost today? Now, I don't mean to throw a guilt complex on you, okay? Because sometimes I feel we kind of berate ourselves too much. But if you have to feel guilty to be motivated, that's fine. What I did with my class this week, I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the positive side. Folks, attendance in class is important in my college classroom. And I tell you what, if you'll have less than three absences, I'll add three points to your final grade. Really? Okay. And then I, another class, I said, now, if you need to be motiva motivated in a negative way, every absence you have after three is going to be five points deducted from your grade. I like to be motivated by the positive. So what are we doing about these today? Whatever it is we're doing today, let's make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can today and every day. So what does this have to do with our reading? Our, our text here is in James chapter 5. We'll call it the conclusion. Brethren, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. This is our mission today. This is the most important thing of our time is understanding this passage and being able to apply it to our lives. It's, it's all about the text. Now, let's look at a couple words, wanders, truth, turns, and error. And we'll come back to that text and, and we'll kind of make sure that we understand it. Wanders, um, the brown is uh, Webster's Dictionary, uh, to deviate from a course. The green are words that we find in different English translations. Air, stray, slip away. And the blue um, is a result of many minutes of time trying to hunt down the meaning of the original word in the documents of the New Testament. Cause to roam, wander away. I think we get the idea of wanders. All right, truth. Oh, by the way, the word wander comes from the word planet. Actually, the word planet came from the ancients' idea that these star-looking things wandered out there in the sky. That's where we got the word planet come from. Okay. <clears throat> I'd say far out, but we'll move on. All right, truth. <laughs> truth. The body of true statements are prepositions. Truth and God. Truth. And I like this one by Arton Gingrich. The content of Christianity as the what? Absolute. I work at a university. You're not supposed to say absolute truth. You say absolute truth and you're going to be like, buddy, I have problems with you because no one knows anything absolutely. Everything's relative. It's true to me today, but whatever. You know, this is kind of the idea of the universities, which I call plural versities. Anyway, truth. Turns means to bend or change the course, to revert or to turn someone. So that's when we look at the word turn in this passage, that's what it means. And then error. Our brother already mentioned the word error in his prayer, if you listen very, very carefully. An act or condition of ignorant or imprudent deviation from a code of behavior. Parents, do your children ever err? Teachers, your students at school, do they, do they ever err? How about us, right? So error, fraudulence, a wandering from the path of truth. So these are words that we need to be familiar with when we're looking back at this passage. Now with this in mind, Would someone want to summarize this passage? Who can summarize this passage? Say it in other words. Well, it happened to me. It happened to, to me. Okay, so. And someone, David Lynch by name, his wife Lorraine, who I will never forget. 
turned me back. Not easily. I was not easily turned. But he was not easily deterred from my lack of wanting to turn. So you were going this way. I was going the wrong way. You were going the right way at one time. Then you turned. You went another way. And this person kept on working with you. About six and a half, seven months. So you're a living example to this passage. Anybody else? Well, let's look at this. What's the subject of this passage? It's one sentence, right? What's, what's the subject? Re all right, that's the topic. What's the subject of the sentence? Because that's, that's, that's the theme of the sentence. Brethren, right? Brethren. Now, do you all see the if-then there? There is an if, but you don't see the, the then, right? This is a logical statement, too. It's a... It's propositional logic. Brethren, that's the audience. If what? If two things. What are the two things? If anyone among you wanders from the truth and what? Someone turns him back. Then, you could put a then there. Then let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Does that make sense? All right, so if I was going to summarize it, brothers or sisters, if any member roams from the way and one of you turns him back, let him know that that person that he, uh, that he has caused his return will save a soul from death, from hell, and cover many sins. That man that you just mentioned did a great service. I think so. You personally invested in that and covers a multitude of sins. That's tremendous. Now, here are some passages that are related to this topic, and the topic is restoration, reaching out to those that have fallen away. Um, <coughs> uh, Galatians 6.1, you remember that passage says, he that is spiritual, right, let him reach out. Hebrews 12.2, we should be looking to Jesus. John 8.31, the truth shall what? Sh shall set us free. Uh, 1 Peter 1.21 talks about your obedience to the truth, the gospel. 1 uh, Chronicles chapter 28 talks about Solomon and that if he would just stay true to God and not wander away. Galatians 5 verses 2 through 4. The Bible says ye that are... Um, let, let's look at that. Galatians 5. Everybody turn there. We were already in the book of Galatians, right? This morning. By the way, Galatians chapter 1 says there's what? Many gospels? There's one. That's narrow minded. You know, you're narrow minded if you think there's one gospel. Oh, I don't want to be narrow minded. I best, uh, maybe there's other things, okay? How easily we are swayed from that truth. So, anyway, Galatians 5 and verse 4. You are severed, you that will be justified by the law. You are what? Fallen what? Does fallen from grace sound like a good condition to be in? No, we, we, we would all say no. Okay. And then we have uh, uh, Timothy, where we have uh, uh, Hymenius and, and this other gentleman that, that went away. And there's some other passages there. Uh, Daniel 12 and verse 3. Let's have someone read that. I need someone to read Daniel 12 and verse 3, and I need someone to read Proverbs 11, verse 30. Who'd like to read the Daniel passage? Okay, we got uh, Brother Spake. Who'd like to read the Proverbs passage? Okay, we got a brother right here, Brother Scott. All right, as soon as you get to that, let's look at Daniel. You want to be a star, I don't mean a Hollywood star, you want to have a star on a, on a sidewalk, more than a star on a sidewalk. Be a person that will turn someone from unrighteousness to what? Righteousness. Let's look at that other passage. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. 
he that wins money, he that wins what? Is our, is our life, are our lives invested in this idea of winning souls? That's a good question. All right, so let's look at the passages verse by verse. Brethren, five times in the chapter. Now, if any of you errs, son, son, if you go over the speed limit, this is what's going to happen. Does the father think the son may at one point go over the speed limit? Yeah, it's possible. One can err from the truth. You can gradually move away from the will of God. It could be a gradual thing. And one of the key things is doubt about the authority of God's word. That's just so, such a simple thing, a little doubt, and uh, you're on your way in a lot of cases. Or you could be swayed for, by somebody else. So you can yield to temptation or fail to exercise caution. Um, this is assumed to be true. It's assumed this is going to happen. Brethren, brothers and sisters, listen. Now, the Bible talks about people that have erred. They left their what? They, uh, their unfruitful branch, the foolish virgins, and you're a spiritual adulterer. We don't like to think about that, okay? But that is Bible language. So this is what he's talking about in this verse. If you err, <coughs> err from the truth. Now, if we want to be right with God, there's two ways to be right with God. If I'm not a Christian, I could become a Christian. Hear, right? What's next? That's right, believe. We've got to what? Repent. We have to what? Confess. And we need to be what? Okay, so, or if I'm an erring child of God, I repent, confess, and pray. We talked about confession the last time, right? Okay. Now, we are ever in danger of forsaking the truth and falling into sin. We are. Okay, now there's this belief that you never can be. What's that called? Once saved what? Always saved. Okay. Now, Paul had seen um, this happen with his own brethren. Our brother just read the passage from Galatians chapter 1 that makes it abundantly clear. By the way, those brothers, those Galatian brothers, did they move away from the gospel? Yes. Yeah, he says, I'm surprised you so soon moved away from the gospel, which is not another gospel. All of these passages right here talk about falling away. You can fall away from the truth. You can fall away from God. There is no once saved, always saved. There's once saved and then I, I was saved at one time. I mean, we can say that. The pig was washed at one time, but we can fall away. Now, I know we've, we've had some real powerful preachers up here that try to really, you know, scream it at us or help us in any way possible to understand we can fall away. That is a false doctrine. Not only is it a false doctrine, it gives deceiving comfort to those folks whose soul is in jeopardy. And, and that should anger us, that anybody would want to follow that. All right. From the truth. Truth is important. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and what? Is there truth? This is our cultural, this is where we are in our culture. The secular humanist has pushed so hard in his worldview, and now we have uh, this idea of plur, plur, plurality that there, any religion is okay. The truth is important. We are, as Christians, begotten by the truth. We're purified by the truth. We're saved by the word of truth. We are made free by the word of truth. Truth. Truth is important. You remember Jesus before Pilate? And Jesus said, for the truth I come into the world. And Pilate said, what is what? What is truth? Boy, he must, he's like a 20th century, 21st century man. What is truth? People are asking that question in our society, and this is the answer. The answer is the Bible talks about the truth. 
Truth is something that must be what? It's not academic only. It's academic, we need to understand it, but it's more than just academic. It's not just the searching of the mind. I hope to find the truth someday. It's not only something to be studied. We want to study the truth. But a man must submit his mind to the truth. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1, verse 7. How much of our lives should be submitted to the truth? Only at church, right? I mean, Paul, writing the Colot to the Colossians, said, what, whatever you do in church, in word or deed, do all to the glory of the Father. And then what he said? Is that what he said? What did he say? Whatever you do, he didn't say in church. Does that mean in our secular life also? Are you telling me I need to obey God and recognize God's authority and the will of God through the Bible and other things in my life when I go to school, when I'm on my job, when I'm driving in the car, and I get run off the road by a big 18-wheeler? No, just kidding. So our whole life, our response, our reaction to the truth, we need to love the truth. We need to obey the truth. <coughs> We need to display the truth to others and speak the truth, what? Ephesians 4, speak the truth in, in love, okay? Speak the truth in love. Manifest it in our life. Isn't that what that person did with Brother Jim up here? Hey, you're not going the right way. When I first became a Christian, I, I lived with members of the church and they sent me away to freight Hardeman. and I had been in the military, you know, and I had come back and I wanted, I wanted to study. And so I became a Christian, a member of the church in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I learned right away that this book, the Bible, is really important to Christianity. And so I decided they were just going through elders at that time, and elders needed to be people of the book. So I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I just go, whatever I do, I need to know this book. So I decided to go to Freed Hardeman and, and take all my VA education benefits and pay to get a degree in the Bible. Some of the people that knew me said that was a total waste of time for you to do that. But I didn't decide what was, based, what was right on what other people said. I tried to do what I believe God was saying. And I did get a degree in the Bible at Freed Hardeman College, okay? Not by the truth in what? Sell it not. Can we sell ourselves out on the truth? Okay. All right, now, study it. Give diligence to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. What? Rightly dividing. Now, there was a member of the church in Covington, and he was a man that cut cloth. They called that name. He did it for like a long, long time, years. And that word, rightly dividing the truth, is a word describing someone cutting cloth right down the middle. You're not deviating to the right, and you're not devi deviating to the left. That line has been set, and that line has been set by God. Now, you may remember at the beginning of the year, the elders put forth this idea that we'd like to do some apologetics in the congregation. And so this, <laughs> this day will mark my one year of, of teaching at this fine congregation of God's people, and apologetics was part. Apologetics is part of this lesson as well. So this is a foundation for your life. Um, Christ Jesus is the chief cornerstone. If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And no other foundation has been laid than that which is already laid, which is who? Okay. So Jesus is a cornerstone. Now, here's those blocks. And what these blocks represent is the most foundational truths that you are striving to base your life upon. Creation, scripture, redemption, knowledge, freedom. Now, let me ask you a question. If the world is just material, if the world is just material, is there any sense in morality? 
If the world is just material, could there be any uniformity in nature? No, because it would be changing all of the time. The world does show uniformity. Therefore, materialism is a false view of reality. <clears throat> you saw this before, so I just want to make the point. All of reality, all of reality can go back to God. God and Christ, the Christian view of reality, Christianity, or the philosophy of Christ, or what the Bible says about Christ and God. These are things that helps us put it all together in our life. Um, now, I'm just kind of just get through here. But my point is, is that you want to base your life upon God's view of reality. Now, if you look on the news, you notice a lot of bad things are happening in our world. Am I right? I believe the reason why a lot of bad things are happening in all of these areas of life, even America, folks, is because people have removed Christ as a cornerstone and have put man or some changing thing in there and are just trying to just go with the flow and they are not helping the situation. Brethren, if any of you err from the truth and someone convert them, we all have a duty, we have a responsibility to turn, help turn the person away. It's, we're not turning them away, we're just spending some time with them to help them to see where, what, what they're really doing. Can you say that another way real quick? Yes. At one time, I was engaged to somebody besides Lisa. And someone took me aside and said, do you really want to marry this person? I didn't like them coming to me. You know, it's more comfortable for me to do what I want to do. And I'm glad they did, okay? Because 29 years later, we're going in the right direction. All right. So let him know. So if we realize when we get turned away from God, we're simply deceived. Y'all like the Transformers? You know, there's the Transformers and there's the Decepticons, okay? Always trying to deceive us. Save a soul from death. This is a spiritual type of death. You've seen this chart before, so I'm just going to say to you, hey, we're all human. We become saved, but we can become disobedient. Where will the disobedient go after death? We already had that conversation, okay? We already had that conversation. So when is the time to talk to the disobedient? Okay. <coughs> I'm just going to move on. So we need to share in this work. Jesus, uh, our sins are covered by the blood. This takes us back to the mercy seat that we talked about on Wednesday. The great power, wisdom, and awesomeness of God can hide our sins. By the way, this is the end of the letter, and this is the, kind of toward the end of our time together. Our study of James ends talking about helping people to be in the soul-winning business. Kaufman says, there's no signature here. James is not about James. It's about a man bending his heart to God willing to get on his hands and knees and pray for the people of God. Brother Wood says, this ends one of the truly great documents of the New Testament. I like what this says. A man with compassion and vision. This man we call James. So, how about some application? Which one of these is an important thing for us to talk about as we wind it down? What responsibility do we have toward the Aaron? Who painted that picture? Who made these curtains? Who made the tiles in the foyer? Dave McGookin, right? Now, I didn't know that man, but when I came here, I came to realize that man had a lot of talent, and this man has erred from the faith. Has he not? So I did what I could to find this man. And after getting lost three or four times, I found this house. And I tried to talk to this man. I'd love to say that the man said, thank you for being here. I'll come back to church the next time. But, you know, it's going to take a little bit more than that to get that man back in the church. It's going to take the church. 
perhaps we can do more in this area of reaching out to those that have erred from the faith. Question or comment? We're going to end this time together by asking Brother Chris to come up here and lead a prayer for those that are lost and those that are erred. Father, we're thankful for this time that we have together. We're thankful for the diligence and the preparation that Brother Bob has done this entire quarter to present this fine book from thy word to us. Father, we realize that there are several that are unfaithful to thy church. We know who they are. We know where they live. Father, may we take initiative upon ourselves and realize that it's not just the preacher or the elder's job to do it. We all have part in this that we can try to say an encouraging word, send an encouraging card, make a phone call, send an email, something that would let these folks know that we still love them and we want them back. Father, we pray for thy forgiveness. We pray for thy long suffering. We pray for more time for these folks to realize what needs to be done so that they can come back to their first love before it's everlasting too late. Father, continue to watch over and care for us, and when we find opportunities, may we seize them. Be with us as we continue thy worship in this place today. Forgive us when we fail thee, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As usual, first class. Appreciate it. Thank you. First class. Thank you, I appreciate it.